We are excited to hold Beyond the Bars 2021. We faced the challenges of creating a virtual conference, then of postponing the conference because of supporting the graduate students, workers union at Columbia University, and then having to completely reorganize the days that it is being presented. But it's happening. The context of this year's Beyond the Bars is COVID-19, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the murders of so many others from racism, the growing resistance, the defeat of Trump, and calls and actions in so many areas of life for a vision of a better society. Thank you, my sister, and good evening, y'all. My name is Letitia Morris, and tonight we're heading towards freedom, a conversation on abolition in 2021. We have an amazing lineup for you this evening, so sit back and join us for a conversation with Dr. Gina Dent, Dean Spade, Dawn Harrington, and the center's own Ivan Kalev, and a performance by Brian Bain. Thank you. What odds are you up against? 93 million miles from the sun, 90 miles under the earth under 700,000 pounds worth of pressure for no less than one billion years. Carbon-rich rocks grind near the mantle of the planet, rise over 6,000 degrees and manage to shine. You see, a diamond has a lump of coal that stuck it out. Like time confined behind enemy lines, so cold no soul can thaw, so it thugs you out. One out of five molecules inside of you is carbon. That carbon used in paint on canvas with brushes. That carbon effused from a pen as ink rushes. That carbon in the graphite of a lead pencil an artist clutches under pressure. With just enough time at the right temperature, that carbon stardust in us is reborn in its richest form. Art against the odds. Lyrics outlive armored cars. No matter how the road gets hard, blood splattered on the boulevard. No man can stop the spark of God art against the eyes at the bottom of the barrel. After falling to your peril, recall the caterpillar is a herald of sky. Wings within drawing near to fly art against the odds. Even giant surrender to the singer's song. Goliath was no match for young David's psalms. That stone in his palm sang until the enemy was gone. And a boy was crowned king with his own throne to sit on. Art against the odds. As it is written in the stars, braided in the DNA of who we are. Blues melodies are the remedy for scars. Spit 16 bars to defuse that ticking time bomb. The ants can conquer the elephant. A rose rises through the sediments. Our story illuminates evidence, the brilliance of resilience born in our basic elements. Art against the odds embraces our flaws and laughs at unjust laws with irreverence. Moves military squads and heals wounds with good bush medicine. Gives clues to the invisible and brings together the broken parts of us into the indivisible. Until so invincible, even after being crushed, we rise up. Art for and against gives birth to the best defense, the defenseless ever since. Without recompense, we art the world and Noah's ark the world. When drenched with doubt and cynicism, art survives the bars of the largest prison toilet paper and toothpaste transform into chess pieces until the day the Louisiana State Penitentiary releases the Angola Three after 44 years in their six by nine box where Albert Wood Fox was locked in silence but coal under pressure makes diamonds and so our minds shine and glisten like a soldier on his last mission, enemy territory captured in the final chapter of his story, facing a firing squad, using his last words to pass along an old poem he once heard. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, with my very last breath I say, 
I lived my life and I will give my life like that spark in the dark at the heart of the earth where fallen stars torn apart come together disguised as dirt. But you can't hide our worth when the going gets hard. We make art against all odds. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a conversation about abolition and movement building. My name is Dawn Harrington. I'm a formerly incarcerated woman, hub mentor for National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Our mission is to end the incarceration of women and girls, free her. And I'm the executive director of Free Hearts, a Tennessee statewide organization led by formerly incarcerated women that is organizing families impacted by incarceration with the ultimate goals of reuniting families and strengthening communities. I will be the monitor for this very important conversation today. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. Gina Dent is the Associate Professor of Feminist Studies, History of Consciousness and Legal Studies at UCSC is a committed activist, scholar, and educator. Abolition Feminism Now, March 2021, Haymarket Press, co-authored by uh, Dent with Angela Davis, Beth Ritchie, and Erica Miners, grows out of her work as an advocate for human rights and prison abolition. She's the editor of Black Popular Culture, and author of numerous articles on race, feminism, popular culture, and visual art. Thank you, Gina. Next, we'll go to Ivan Kalaf. Um, Ivan is a research assistant at the Social Relations Lab at Columbia University. Since joining the lab in August, Ivan has served as a teaching assistant for courses at Sing Sing Correctional Facility. Ivan is interested in social justice as well as urban policy. Currently, Ivan is a student at Columbia University's School of Professional Studies and is a Justice and Education Initiative Scholar. Outside of the lab, Ivan is a father, a musician, and an artist. Welcome, Ivan. Last but not least, we have Dean Spade. Um, Dean has spent over two decades in social movements, working to end prisons, borders, poverty, and war, and support people trying to survive right now. He is the author of Normal Life, Administrative Violence, Critical Trans Politics, and The Limits of Law, Mutual Aid, Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the Next, and the director of the documentary Pink Washing Exposed. So we're gonna get right into the questions. And my first question um, is, how are each of you involved in working or thinking about abolition? And so I'll briefly answer this question and then I'll pass it to my fellow panelists. Um, in our work at the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, um, we, we're thinking about abolition a lot from the importance of having to reimagine communities to build up the resources in communities to make abolition real. And so a lot of um, thinking of my thinking around abolition, both on a statewide level in Tennessee, but also on a national level is, um, is, the, is the importance that we're gonna have to build as we burn. And um, just to give a little bit of an example with, um, we passed, community-based alternatives to incarceration for primary caretakers here in Tennessee. And we were the second state and the national council to pass that law. It was also passed in Massachusetts and it's pending in 11 different states. And um, when we were working to pass that law here, um, you know, a lot of our rural uh, folks, um, rural legislators and rural folks on the ground were like, you know, that sounds good, but we don't even have, you know, housing, anger management, all of these different, uh, you know, community infrastructure that's needed. 
And we've lost a lot of just hospitals, you know, across our whole state. And so, you know, we don't even have a hospital here type of situation. And so in order to get to abolition, a lot of what I've been working on and thinking about is um, reimagining communities and the understanding that in order to get to abolition, it's not just about, you know, burning the whole system down, but we have to build and create new institutions um, in order to be able to abolish. So um, I want to pass it to Dean Spade. Um, Dean, how are how are you involved in or working on or thinking about abolition? Thanks, and thanks for introducing us and being our moderator. Um, I'm so glad to be part of this group. Um, you know, I want to say that part of how I came to be involved in this work is be because I've been doing like trans and queer and feminist um, liberation work for a long time. And for my whole adult life, we've been living in a time where um, police and prisons were justified as being something that would help queer and trans and, people and women. And like, it's been this actual area of expansion, this kind of like pro-police um, queer or trans politics, this idea that they would protect us or save us. And this idea that we should, the way we should approach domestic violence and sexual assault in our society is through increasing criminalization. So I think I came into this politics because I was part, I am part of feminist and queer and trans communities that know that police are really bad for us and that prisons are terrifying, horrible, tortured devices that do nothing good for queer and trans people and women. Um, so that's sort of my trajectory that got me here. And also always part of that work is directly supporting queer and trans people and people in women's prisons. Um, you know, that's so much of my day to day has been about trying to help people who are facing that criminalization or that um, imprisonment, because um, that's always what abolitionists are doing, directly supporting people inside or criminalized communities or people in the um, criminal process while we're also trying to get rid of the system. These days, a lot of what I work on is, is based here in Washington state and here in Seattle on Duwamish land where I live. Um, I just realized I'm talking way too fast. <laughs> Apologies to the interpreter. Um, so I've been involved in various campaigns to stop expansion um, here. Like we worked on a seven year campaign to stop King County from building a new youth jail. And during that time, I think we really changed the conversation in King County about imprisonment. So that when 2020 erupted in these uprisings, um, there was a real opening for talking about closing that jail because they did build it. Um, uh, in 2020, we also fought against a new women's prison being constructed in Washington, and we won that fight. Um, and now we're fighting against the expansion of a mental health prison called Western State Hospital. Um, and also, this is part of a group I'm with now called No New Washington Prisons. Um, we're also trying something new that we've never tried before, which is that during the legislative session, we ran a campaign to oppose all criminalizing, all bills that expand criminalization. And why that matters is because a lot of those bills, people pretend are progressive. Like there was a hate crime bill. There is all these bills that further criminalize carrying weapons. And supposedly they're aimed at the right wingers who are carrying weapons in our state, but they're actually gonna be used against youth of color. All the evidence shows that's who gets the weapons charges. So we're trying to, instead of doing a typical legislative strategy of like bill by bill battling it out in the state capitol, we're trying to just run a popular campaign against all expansion just to see if that changes the conversation since the legislative realm is like this kind of elitist, non-profitized, like very So we're just trying, you know, we're fighting a police station um, in one of the lo localities here, just trying to like say absolutely not another penny, not another brick towards the system. While of course we work to support people who are in the system now and we work towards defunding the police um, all around the state as much as we can. Thank you very much. And now I would like to go to um, Gina Dent, the same question. Um, how are you involved in working on or thinking about abolition? Thank you, Dawn. It's so lovely to be with you all today. 
Um, I, I think I'll focus just on what I've been doing in the pandemic. <laughs> um, like Dean, I've spent decades doing various kinds of things re- re- involving abolition, um, not only in the U.S., but in other parts of the world. But during the pandemic, I've actually been mostly working with a colleague at UC Santa Cruz, Rachel Nelson, on a series of webinars uh, called Visualizing Abolition. And, and the reason I want to talk about this work, which actually was developed in conjunction with an uh, art exhibition called Barring Freedom that Rachel and Alexandra Moore organized and that is currently on display at the San Jose Museum of Art. I want to talk about this work because visualizing abolition for me is the result or culmination of decades of really thinking critically about how our weddedness to policing and to imprisonment is connected to what we've been exposed to. Um, I first started out thinking about this through uh, the history of film, um, none of which contains a time before prisons. Uh, And then I moved to thinking about it in relationship to popular culture and the overwhelming amount of hours in the day during which we are subjected to images that come from some um, part of our carceral system. Uh, For example, uh, decades ago when I started this, uh, when there was something called TV Guide, which I don't think exists anymore, but, and you could search online um, to put prison or jail, and there would be something at every hour of every day, uh, whether it was a cartoon or um, a film or a TV show or a Law & Order episode, um, there was always something. And so I really wanted to think critically about what that immersion um, did to us, um, especially in terms of what we actually thought we were deliberating when we were talking about whether or not we thought prisons were going to be something that we would have to keep in this world. So as, as an abolitionist, I've been so excited in this moment, in this terrible pandemic, to have the uh, strange gift to um, have our conversations go online and connect to people in many parts of the world. And so the series is a series working with artists and also uh, activists and academics who have been committed to abolition or who are newer to abolition to really talk together about uh, these consequences. And so we're focusing on everything from this whole environment that I referred to of image culture, but also we're talking about really um, compressing time in the ways that artists help us to do. So using the artworks to help us think historically and in terms of the future and slowing down and allowing us to address very carefully and in nuanced ways, the ways we are uh, dependent on incarceration, even for those of us who have for a long time been working toward abolition. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the same question for you, Ivan. How are you um, involved in working on and thinking about abolition? Thank you, Dawn. Can you guys hear me? Some of my microphones been acting a little hinky. Um, so I work as a researcher at Columbia University. First of all, I spent uh, about 85% of my life in uh, some type of institution or other. So from foster care to juvie to Rikers Island, state prison, ultimately state prison. Uh, so I have a sort of different outlook on abolition. I, and I'm still in the process of sort of uh, establishing my relationship and my understanding of what abolition is and what it can be. Uh, in the interim, I work with, uh, I also work as a reintegration specialist and I help connect folks who are making a transition home from prison or jail and sort of hook them up with the resources they may need to sort of make that transition as smooth as possible. Um, so, like I said, I'm still, uh, so I work with uh, folks from the law school, uh, Bernard Hogg. I've sat in several of his uh, classes and panels on abolition and I've learned a great deal. Uh, a lot of stuff that I didn't know about abolition, I didn't understand, and I'm still grappling with. And so I'm not sure. Uh, in, the, in, in the interim, I, I work with organizations like, excuse, I work with organizations like RAP, uh, uh, Worth Rises, uh, Exodus, folks who are in the field, uh, trying to get folks out of prison, helping folks who are in prison, 
uh, helping folks who are out stay out. Uh, so if that falls under the umbrella or the ambit of uh, abolition, then I'm probably an abolitionist. But uh, I want to I explore that a little more later on if we, if we have a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I saw we have an interpreter switch. Are we good? All right, perfect. All right, so moving right along, welcome everyone. And um, so now we're gonna get into some more broad questions about abolition. And my first question, and anyone can answer this, how, why has abolition become such a popular, um, hot topic? And um, I can just give a little bit of commentary on my end. Um, we, we did a statewide survey here in Tennessee, and um, this was in 2019. And, um, you know, just getting a temperature check on folks all across our state. And a lot of people weren't really leaning towards abolition. You know, we had the groups that we knew that were very much um, abolitionists and deep in community with us. Um, but as a, as a larger uh, community, as a larger uh, community across our state, um, a lot of folks weren't really there. And then around, um, and then I was actually zero in on Nashville, which is where I lo I'm located. Um, and around budget season of last year, um, a lot of things were happening. Um, uh, George, George Floyd was murdered. Um, and uh, Breonna Taylor was mur murdered. We had a, uh, a couple of police murders um, in Nashville around that time as well, and surveyed the um, city at that time within three days, um, and it was around the budget, within three days, uh, we got over 5,000 responses and half were saying to abolish the police. And so, um, you know, it really has become a hot topic and, and less, you know, just about the abolition, abolitionist organization. And why has abolition become such a popular hot issue or topic um, in this time? And anyone can answer that question. Well, I guess I'd be happy to start. Um, I, I don't think I'm, um, I don't know if I have the correct interpretation of that uh, question because that's, it's hard to answer, but I think there are a lot of things that we probably should should um, lift up. I mean, you know, these things have always appear uh, as if out of nowhere. But for those of us who've been involved for decades, we know that this has been uh, there's been a very intentional um, uh, set of you know um, activities that organizers and those currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated have been involved in for decades now. Uh, some of us, you know, there are various dates we give to the prison abolition movement. Uh, many people uh, start out by thinking about Attica and the demands um, made by those inside during Attica. And I, I think that's an appropriate uh, way to think about the beginning. And, and so, so many people have been working to uh, make, as I, I'm paying attention to now, make art, uh, do research, uh, do community organizing, uh, talk with their families. And uh, there have been so many documentaries, there have been so many um, protests that have increasingly included um, other issues. Uh, and therefore, we're also introducing abolition to people who are doing other kinds of work. And so this really is a culmination of so many things. And the pandemic has just made everything more extreme. And so the problem of time in the, especially in the United States, we could talk about it elsewhere, the problem of the way we relate to work, uh, the problem of the way we don't have things like healthcare and safety, those things have become exacerbated during the pandemic in such a way that I think as we were all forced 
to watch um, the media representations of the deaths, uh, particularly of George Floyd and, and, and a few others last year, we were really um, not able to look away and also strangely forced to be quiet in relationship to things. And so uh, getting out in the streets and realizing that we shared so many of the same demands and so many of the same analyses has really consolidated this movement. But this did not start uh, last year and it takes generations to build a movement like this. So I think we're now finally ready for abolition after so many failures of reforms. I just want to add to that. I really agree with what Gina is saying. I think that part of what movements do is like till the soil and try to create the right conditions for a long time. And you don't know when things might pop off and become more widely popular. But when you do, people use all the tools that movements have been creating, you know, thinking about the 20 plus years of critical resistances work, thinking about all the deep feminist work that's been going on for so long that allows us to have responses to like, but what about the rapist? But what about the murderers? Like that allows us to actually analyze reforms, all of that. But I also think there's an interesting additional trajectory I would add to that picture. I mean, we could just go on about this picture forever. Um, but there's something about um, how, I, you know, I, I remember really clearly this speech that Kathy Cohen gave where she talked about the rejection of respectability politics by the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter activists in the first round in like the 2016-ish, like when Mike Brown died, like Ferguson uprising, and how people were saying that trying to take the inside route and trying to look respectable to the system and get people to negotiate with you on mild reforms is bullshit, and and that it, and that people were rejecting that even in what they wore. She had this really great analysis of it. Um, but, and then I think that's also happening simultaneously during the Obama administration about immigration reform. People are like, this guy isn't actually doing anything for us. He keeps not delivering. And I think people, I think the Obama administration actually helped a lot of people wake up to the limits of the Democratic Party because there was so much hope around him as the first black president. And then he did the same stuff that all the other presidents have done, like war and deporting people, but he did more of it. And, you know, being the president of the most imprisoning country in the world and not changing that and doing these mild police reform, a lot of signaling that he cared about stuff, not a lot of delivering into communities. And so I think that that matters. I think that kind of, cre like, it's not as if there's anything new about how horrible the system of imprisonment and policing is. But I think that there's been a bubbling up of, of feeling like, no one's coming to save us from a, some new administration. No, nothing's going to, um, that's not going to change. And then you get the Trump administration and people feel increasingly desperate and, and terrified of the power of the government. And then you get the pandemic and a lot of people are out of work and people are more likely to go into the streets when they're out of work. Like that's, it's just like nothing to lose. You know, I can't pay my rent. I have no childcare. Like, that I think increasing desperation does often have something to do with when things really pop off. It's unfortunately George Floyd's murder was not unusual because that's exactly what the police do. Breonna Taylor is like so many other women, but at the same time, the um, the combat the combined pressure cooker. I mean, I always wonder: is it a mystical thing? Why does it pop off when it pops off? Right? Like there was nothing new about um, wealth inequality when we saw Occupy Wall Street emerge and suddenly force at least on the surface, some kind of open discussion about the severe wealth inequality and income inequality in our country. Like, I don't know why things, when they explode, they explode. But um, it's, I never knew that in my lifetime I would see people across the country talking about defunding the police, like that, that, that abolition would mainstream in this way. And of course it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of debates about what it all means, but I think it's very exciting that we are actually living in that moment where it is, like a hot topic it can be discussed in all kinds of media it's not just like the thing a few wing nuts are believing in thank you very much um all right so the next question is what is the vision of abolition and how do we connect the vision of where we want to go with the reality that we have right now so what is the vision of abolition and how do we connect the vision of where we want to go 
with the reality that we have right now. Um, and I will just um, give one quick comment before I see um, who, whoever wants to answer this question uh, can answer this question. And um, um, basically, you know, I think that the vision of abolition is also like the vision of collectivizing and building cooperative solutions um, that are controlled by community um, to the issues that we have. And partly that's because considering the fact that these carceral systems um, are in response and also create more of uh, social problems that um, we have, such as poverty, such as homelessness, such as the illness of addiction, um, such as trauma, um, and uh, mental health, et cetera. And it, it also creates more of itself. And But when it comes to like the overall vision um, and, and my, in my thoughts and in my thinking, um, I think that whatever we come up with, we can't create it um, under the same capitalist system, under the same capitalist um, um, structures. And what we create that's new has to be community um, has to be co community controlled, has to be, um, you know, the way that our money spent, it has to be decided on by the by the larger community and not uh, the way that the things were created. And I think that is the vision of abolition. The vision of abolition is a collective and a cooperative vision. Um, and that's just my opinion, but open it up for the other panelists what is the vision of abolition and how do we connect the vision of where we want to go with the reality that we have right now? You guys mind if I jump in on this? Um, so just sort of contextualize. Uh, so I grew up in the South Bronx and, you know, like I said, I jumped around. I was jumped around from foster home to foster home and uh, never had a real stable environment and uh, the uh, presence of prison right was always a constant it was always there looming like it wasn't a matter of if it was a matter of when like i knew i was heading in that direction like that place was where i was going ultimately right uh and for a lot of my friends and colleagues and, and associates it was the same thing uh so and, and it was crazy because a lot of the the elders and a lot of the folks in the neighborhood would, you know, would see someone doing bad, I mean, using drugs or whatever, messing up. And they would say, you know what, that guy, that person needs to go away for a little while, you know, to sort of get his weight up and, you know, whatever, get his teeth fixed, uh, get, get his GED, whatever the case may be. And they saw prison as providing those things as a good place, you know. Uh, and, and. On the surface, it was, you know, because it did provide those things, you know, but what they didn't see was, the, you know, the things that prison did to people, you know, the wounds that it inflicted and exacerbated. But uh, it was a constant. It was there. It was something that we knew uh, we could, I don't want to say depend, but I'm going to use it for the lack of a better word, a place that we could depend to always be there. And then when I thought about abolition and, you know, before I sort of, you know, of taking something away, right? But there's so little in black and brown communities, and particularly in, in the neighborhood that I grew up in, that if you took this place away, where would I get medical? Where would I get my GD? Where would I get all these things that prison provides? You know, and, and it was sort of crazy thinking, but I can get these things in these places, and so could a lot of people that I grew up with. And if you took this away, what do we have left? I mean, there's so very little here. So that's what I was grappling with until, you know, until I began to have these great conversations with folks and, and read about that abolition wasn't just about creating a void or, or just subtracting, it was, it was about, it's additive, it's about adding things. So I think that, uh, so we're aiming at prisons and we're aiming at the police, uh, but there are other things. So prison is just a, a, a result of, 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 a, of, of a greater problem, right? So the problem is, you know, food inequities, uh, health inequities, uh, economic inequities, uh, and so many other things uh, that if we take care of those things, if we take care of those things, I think prison will be the least, the least of our problems. You know, so, um, uh, so I just, 
they, so it's difficult for me. I'm still, like I said, I'm still trying to find my place in this whole abolitionist thing. Uh, but, uh, um, and, and, you know, when I hear people talk about reform, it, uh, it sort of, it, it bothers me a little bit when they just talk about re solely reform, because reform means to me uh, pour money into the police and not into the communities. And the police don't need the money, right? So I think reform and abolition, sort of people speak it, speak of those two things as if they exist in separate worlds or as if they're mutually exclusive. But I think, you know, they should, those two, th two things are married. Because even as we speak about what could happen in the future, there are people right now in prison, right, who need a tissue paper, who need uh, uh, to get to the hospital right now as we speak. So even if we can dream about getting rid of prisons, but right now there are people inside that need help right now that need real things. Uh, uh, and we need to talk about uh, getting them, getting them those things and providing them those opportunities uh, as we talk about eradicating prisons and replacing uh, them with something else. So um, anyway, that's my spiel. Uh, I'll pass the mic now. Thank you. And um, interpreter switch. Are we good? All right. Does anyone else want to answer that question? I mean, uh, it's it's a hard one because um, fortunately there isn't a single vision of abolition. Uh, and that's one of the exciting things, even about being on this panel, you know, being the people who are constantly thinking through even the term abolition, it's really designed to reference the historical movement against slavery, to take advantage of the fact that we have in some ways moved beyond um, at least the form of racial slavery that we understand as historical. And there are lots of questions about how we have moved beyond it and whether we've moved beyond it. But most people understand that we have. And yet abolition is designed um, as a term for for prison, for getting rid of prisons, in order to reference that and also reference the fact that people thought they would always live with racial slavery in the way it was before. And, and that um, allowing us to reveal that the common sense of dwelling in this relationship to the state as not one that helps us create security in our lives, but a state that actually deprives us of safety and security is a really important thing for us to come to understand. And that the way to do that is going to require us to have some kind of historical awareness as inspiration, as much as for a reference to current conditions. And so um, I, I think that the vision abolition is, of, of abolition is always this one where we're thinking through. So while we're doing that mutual aid work that Dean talks about, what all the work that Ivan was just talking about, we're always asking questions. Um, and so for me, abolition is really about having vision, even while you're doing all those day-to-day -day activities. I think without that, this work and this survival for most people who are involved with this would be unbearable. Um, it would be impossible. Um, abolition is the thing that's made it possible for so many people, and certainly for me, to be able to um, give aid, to give support, to um, speak up, but knowing that we are looking for a future in which um, these conditions are gone and we live in a, in a freer and um, more compassionate and safer world. And we have successfully redefined safety, as Don was talking about, in communities, right? That, that to me, is what the vision of abolition is. It's not one particular thing. I, I, I have so much I could say on this, but I want to add that so much of the conversation about abolition extends from the United States. But there are other parts of the world that are also um, delving into thinking about abolition and also thinking about the colonial import of imprisonment and the... Um, current imperial uh, trajectory of the United States in establishing the norms of so-called democracy. And so it is really important also to pay attention to different ways that different kinds of communities are engaging with this and trying to, um, to get rid of um, the, these conditions in their worlds as well. Thank you. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, with the National Council, we've been building out an international commission and we've connected with our uh, sisters that are formerly incarcerated 
um, all across the world and uh, several countries. And that's one thing that we've been seeing is a lot of the exporting of um, the carceral system. Like we're seeing drug courts pop up. We're seeing ankle shackles pop up. We're seeing um, private prisons pop up where there weren't any. And it's very interesting that any of what we're doing when we see the, the magnitude of our issues would be being exported, but we're seeing that happen in a in a large scale. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, my next question is about praxis, okay? And so what are people doing that is towards abolition? Um, and what does the, the work look like in practice? And um, I know there are multiplicity of tactics. Um, um, I could just name a couple. One from our local um, work, we're building a bail fund land trust where we're bailing people out. And when the money revolves that we're working to build a cooperative land trust, because one of the things that we've been seeing is, again, the need to build. Um, we're, we're able to decarcerate and get people out and close facilities, et cetera. But people are coming out to nothing. You know, and so uh, we're working on building like a land trust and different cooperatives to build the infrastructure that we need to get closer and closer to abolition. So that's just one example. But I know our panelists probably have great examples. Um, so Praxis, uh, what are people doing that is towards abolition? I'll just jump in briefly to say, I feel like there's like some different buckets of, of things that I think of as abolitionist work. Like one bucket is all the work to stop the expansion of the systems because they're still expanding them. They're still like, oh, now we'll give the police more money to fix the police. Now we'll build another prison to fix the prison. You know, they still are using that same stuff against us. So we always have to be fighting this. Oh, we're going to build another police station. We're going to build a better court. You know, it's the same stuff. Um, and that's a lot of what I've been working on locally here. Another bucket, I think, is just all the work that Ivan and others have referred to of just like supporting the people who are inside right now. And that looks like a lot of things. That looks like trying to get people compassionate release, trying to get people out because of COVID, trying to help people who are getting out have a place to stay so they don't get locked up again, trying to make sure people have people to write letters with people to send them money for the commissary. And then also inside communities on the outside that are having lots of contact with the police. Like, how do we get the police out of people's neighborhoods? How do we get rid of laws that are the most common ones they use to arrest and prosecute people? How do we, you know, put pressure on the prosecutor's office to stop enforcing these things against some people? You know, all of that piece around, like, can we just stop the thing from chewing up our communities? Um, and then the other piece that I think is so important that abolitionists are doing, and I think it's more visible during this defund the police moment, is talking about how else it would work and what what really makes us safe. And so that's, you know, a lot of things like people saying, oh, you know what, um, it doesn't work to arrest people again and again for domestic violence. That doesn't, it's not getting to the heart of gender violence in our, in our lives. So what does work? What do people need to be able to get out of dangerous situations? Oh, they need housing. They need transportation. What do people need to be able to resolve conflict in families or friend circles or in workplaces without hurting each other? Oh, like a different set of like skills around conflict. And can we actually provide those so that we don't even get to a point where we call the police? You know, um, I'm thinking a lot right, just right now about the Oakland Power Projects, which is a, pro a mutual aid project I really admire, where they're like, when, when people call 911 in our community, the police come with the ambulance. And we've seen the police really hurt people when they arrive and kill people. So instead, let's figure out how to have a local project where we skill people up with um, medical support and mental health support skills. So there's somebody else to call when that medical or mental health emergency is happening that's not going to bring the cops. So very practical, detailed, like what are the things the cops do now and how can we have somebody else do them or, you know, how do we get rid of that need? But I do think one of the big pieces of that, which you've spoken to so beautifully, Don, and in the last question is like, and also with a reference to the land trust work, is that if people weren't kept under such extreme poverty and stress, if people had the things they needed, this like most of the, of the stuff the police get called for wouldn't be happening, right? It's like 
if we want people to be safe, why don't we start by making sure they have health care and housing? And I think this for me relates to just like, you know, especially with what Ivan just said about living in a community that's, that thinks that prison is like the best hope for getting something you need. Like ha- we live in a system that keeps people under such extreme duress in order to extract as much wealth as possible. Like some people have to be so poor, but they're facing that kind of choice that Ivan described while other people are so rich. And that entire system produces that crisis that makes people have no no good choice, no way to get dental care, no way to get the things they need. And so I think that like a lot of what abolition does is all these immediate practical steps out of that situation, but it also is this bigger imagining of like, let's get rid of this extractive system that has to make people so, so poor and desperate um, that, you know, that ju- then is used to justify the entire system. Thank you so much. And and um, that that made me think also about about our national uh, kind of like praxis, which is really focusing on like hyper local organizing. And I think that um, seeing the People's Movement Assembly in Jackson, one of the things I just came in on theirs as we were preparing for the first one that we were going to do. And um one of the things that I noticed it was with their community members, the ones who couldn't really see abolition is because they're like, we don't know our neighbors like that, you know? So how do we come together and build solutions if we're not coming together on a hyper-local level? And so that's a lot of how we're thinking about in the National Council as well, like reimagining communities, building unity circles, building transformative justice, for guaranteed basic income in community, you know, community level participatory defense, like, the more we can come together with our neighbors, the more we can uh, come together. And as Dean was saying, like dream and scheme around um, what does our particular area need to, to be safe? Um, so the next question, and um, it's going to be a two part question uh, for whoever would like to answer it. Um, what are the strengths of having a vision of abolition and what are the shortcomings of defining the main issues around abolition and um, and what are the issues that abolition raises for people as individuals and within the larger movement. And so um, I want to actually go to you first, Ivan, if that's okay, because uh, I know you said you were still really thinking a lot about this and trying to see your place. So where, where in your assessment are the strengths and uh, what are the shortcomings and issues that that come up for you um and then after ivan who if anyone else would like to chime in as well thank you uh, great question so just to so anyway uh, some of the work i do is, is providing and we do it where i work at, is providing education opportunities for folks who've been formerly incarcerated uh and education is key right uh I mean, the boy wrote, wrote a great book, Abolition Democracy, talking about how enslaved folks were denied education. It was, it was done purposely, and we all know this. It was done because education is, 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 is foundation for social mobility, economic mobility, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I think it's important. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the first party question, can you repeat the first party? I had a thread and all of Yes. That. Yes, it's what are the strengths of having a vision of abolition? So I combined two questions, so I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, so the strengths, I I think, you know, it's uh, we ultimately all uh, want, uh, uh, you know, uh, folks to be, you know, to, folks to have opportunities and folks to have uh, the freedoms and share the same uh, uh, all the things that everyone else enjoys. We want everyone to enjoy those things. I mean, it's I mean, it, uh, that's the American dream, right? We live in the, milk, the land of milk and honey, and uh, so we're supposed to all uh, enjoy the, the pursuit of happiness and so on and so forth. So I think that's that's a great vision. But uh, I'm sorry, I had thread and I lost my thread. That's such a great question. Um, can I? Can I? I'm sorry, my, my thoughts are a little jumbled. I get a little emotional when I talk about because uh, uh, I have a lot of folks that call me from prison. Uh, uh, they, you know, they call me from prison and we talk about what's going on now with the COVID and, 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 and 
and other things, you know, the abuses that, that go on, and that's ringing in my head right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, abolition is great, you know, and 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 it's it, it's 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 a it's a beautiful thing, it's a wonderful thing. But I'm I'm always stuck in what do we do about right now? Uh, how do we how do we you know how do we help folks right now? And uh, I don't know if abolition answers that for me right now. Uh, it's sort of future based, uh, 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 and I don't know if I'm uh, interpreting it correctly or if I'm getting uh, the right message. But um, you know, I, I like to do the work right now. I like to get in the field. I'm in the Bronx. I'm in the hood. I do a lot of research. Uh, uh, you know, I talk to my people. I talk to my communities. I visited the prisons. You know, I, I TA for Professor Geraldine Downing. Uh, for college courses she teaches inside Sing Sing. And I think, um, you know, and, uh, I, I think abolition is ultimately about changing the narratives, but not just about changing narratives, it's also about changing the narrators, you know, putting position, people, putting people in positions of, of leadership, or forming incarcerated people in positions of leadership to make change, because it's not just about changing narratives, it's about changing the narrators as well, I think. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, my, my thoughts are jumbled, but um, if I can come back to it, I will, please, thanks. Yes, I think that was a wonderful answer, too, and I really appreciate your reflection. Sometimes when we're still grappling with things, it does, you know, seem jumbled, but I got you 100%, brother. All John, right, could I, anyone else want to add to that? Well, I just wanted to say something, because I was really, um, Ivan, you're, you really provoked me talking about abolition being only in the future, and I think it's one of the things that, a lot of us talk about, um, which is that we want to be able to see abolition not only in the future, but look for it around us now. So looking for the possibilities in where, how we're living and also in the past. Um, but I, I want to speak about education because I'm a professor and there have been, and you mentioned um, this program at uh, Columbia, and, and there are many programs emerging around education. And I've had a lot of mixed feelings about some of it and had a lot of conversations with people uh, either formerly incarcerated who are, for example, part of our underground scholars program uh, at University of California, formerly incarcerated folks currently um, doing degrees uh, on campuses, but also um, thinking about those who are currently inside. There's a film that I can't stop talking about that I watched called Since I've Been Down. and uh, Greta Sh- uh, Gilda Shepard's film. And I don't think it's available for everyone to see yet, but I would encourage anyone to watch it. I mean, I, you know, I watch a lot of documentaries about prisons and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to watch them. This one is incredibly inspiring. It's about an education program inside of prisons in Washington state, but it's completely run um, by those inside. And, um, Really, the pr- the program had to begin because the prisons were so far from faculty who could have been teaching and there wasn't an active program. So folks inside organized themselves. What's inspiring about it, I mean, there's so many things inspiring about it. Uh, the people who speak on, uh, on film uh, are so erudite. Uh, in terms of the fields of research that I work in, for example, but they're also incredibly erudite about the conditions that they're finding inside and about their own um, inspiration from doing this teaching work. So I, I want to speak about this because we often talk about education, not incarceration, as if education means one thing, as if you know we just take the kind of education we already have and then we give it to people who are inside. And I, that is not abolitionist education in my and and my thinking. And some people are now using the phrase "abolish the university" to describe this, which doesn't exactly mean what it sounds like. Um, because I think the people who are are talking about this are actually deeply committed to what universities could be and could provide, but see that universities have not always acted against incarceration, but have it been in conjunction with uh, carcerality. And so um, I just wanted to, to put education out there as something for us to discuss, something that needs to be abolitionist, but isn't necessarily yet. And I'm not giving up on it, but I want us to to think about that in terms of what our vision for abolition could be. Thank you very much. All right, so the next question, I'm actually going to go to Dean first on this one. Um, And the question is, um, is it useful to ask, how do we 
define what reforms are liberatory and not reformist. Oh, sorry. Um, I need to do an interpreter switch. Okay, thank you. All right, so Dean, um, is it useful to ask how do we define what reforms are liberatory and not reformist? Um, and after Dean, anyone can feel free to chime in as well. I love this question because I think that um, that is the main thing I see abolition in, abolition in some ways helping us do in the practical day to day is it's a it's a um, a measuring stick that lets us be able to say when the system or the politicians are like, oh, we'll take care of your complaints about the racism of this system or the brutal medical neglect or the transphobia of the system or whatever. Don't worry, we'll take care of it. We'll throw in this reform and this reform and this reform. Um, abolition allows us to have a measuring, to be like, wait, is this getting us where we're going or is this more nonsense? from the system. Is this going to shrink how many people are in contact with the police? Is this going to get people out? Is this going to shrink the budget of the thing? Is this going to move towards what our communities need? Or is this just more of the same nonsense that's going to give the police some new weapon or some fancy other outfit or some training that doesn't actually change what they do? And so to me, this is the best of what a lot of the day-to-day -day conversations look like in my local organizing communities. And I really appreciate, Don, that you talked about this hyper-local organizing, because I think we have so much more likelihood of having impact in our local organizing, but we're told to like watch the federal level, like kind of a celebrity sideshow, like, ooh, it's AOC v. Trump, fun, you know, which is like actually where we have the least likelihood of having an impact day to day. So going, being like, I'm gonna care about my county councils, but it isn't very glamorous, but it's so likely we could actually make a change there if we use collective action. So to me, this kind of debate, the, you know, once we open up that question, is this getting us where we're going or is this just them handing us more kind of like useless crumbs or even things that are better for them and worse for us, like when we have that conversation, then we can have a debate. It doesn't mean we have the answer yet because it could be that you think this police reform is gonna work and I think it's not. And then we're gonna have a juicy debate in our groups and between our groups and, and, and hopefully in ways where we really listen to each other and we can handle having some differences of opinion and we can try stuff out. You know, this debate that happened in California, maybe some of you followed about like, would the bail reform law that was being proposed work? You know, it was going to get rid of money bail, which a lot of people think would be good, but it was going to add in um, this kind of assessment of people's risk factors that was going to put the same people likely, um, you know, being held. And so people were really debating that, I think, in a very meaningful way. That kind of debate is happening all the time. But because we're living in a moment where people are waking up to the lie of a lot of these reforms, we need this conversation. And I just want to share, I'm sure many people who are attending this conference have seen this, but Critical Resistance has a super awesome chart that a lot of us use to give an example of this, which is a chart about how to tell if a police reform is moving us towards um, abolition or if it's just more of the same. And it's, um, it's on the Critical Resistance page and maybe somebody can share it in the chat if people are watching this um, at the conference. But like all of us creating more and more tools like that, also this new book called Prison by Any Other Name um, is a really great tool that says, wait, a lot of these um, electronic monitoring, monitoring plans are actually just more of the same or wow, drug treatment can just be another prison. Like just having us all really take apart, like what is gonna get us closer to the well-being that we're seeking for our communities and actually get people out and what's just gonna like build the system. Thank you so much. All right, so the next question um, is what role does fear play in some people's disagreement with abolition as a vision? Um, and so how do we see fear? Uh, playing out in some people's disagreement with abolition and abolitionist vision. Um, well, fear is a very powerful tool, as we know. I mean, uh, America has done a, an amazing job of making uh, 
everyone fear fear and hate the black and brown body, right? So uh, the face of crime in this country is is the face of the looks like mine. Uh, that's the face of crime. Uh, so when you talk about abolition and you talk about getting rid of stuff and letting people out, and uh, a lot of folks are saying, whoa, 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 you're letting all these crazy criminals out, all these, you know, they've committed heinous crimes and, uh, you know, they're going to come in our communities and they're going to, you know, just, you know, create havoc. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, and, and, it, and, and if you, and if you think about it, it's a, it's a great narrative, right? It's, a, you know, you're thinking about it because everyone wants, you know, to have a safe environment, a safe community. So they want their children to be safe. And you're talking about releasing folks who have killed people, who've hurt people, who've done, you know, all sorts, all manner of violent crimes or, you know, just, uh, and on the, on the surface, it's 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 a great argument, but uh, if if DOCCS does what it's supposed to do, right? If so, I'm just I'm just thinking about these. I'm just I'm talking about the Department of Corrections here in New York State. It's supposed to provide uh, all, all all sorts of uh, rehabilitative, if that's a real word, uh, opportunities for folks who are inside. So a person who spends 20 years, I just I just finished doing 20 years, a person who spends 20 years inside of one of these correctional facilities is supposed to come out rehabilitated. Uh, that's the assumption. So you go on, a person goes in front of a parole board and the parole board looks at everything the person has accomplished, everything, you know, they look at the crime, obviously. Uh, they look at uh, everything the person has accomplished or, or, or not accomplished from the time they came into the system to the time they appear in front of the parole board. And based on that information, the parole board determines whether this person is fit to return back to society. And the assumption is that this person is no longer a threat. So they, 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 they assess your threat uh, level or your risk. A risk assessment is called a risk assessment. And they decide that this person no longer poses a threat to the community, right? And, but once you get out, that's, that, completely, that completely changes, you know. Uh, uh, but... Um, I just think that fear, you know, uh, and that's why so. That's why uh, just to sort of um, harking back to education, and it's not just education for the sake of education or for the sake of, of getting knowledge or, or being in the books, but it's it's for the it's for the sake of being able to uh, um, reshape the narratives that the media and all these other platforms put out about people who are formerly incarcerated about black and brown folks. It's it's and you know it's about being able to change the metrics because the metrics that we use now uh, are metrics of failure. We talk about recidivism, right? And recidivism is a metric of failure. How many people mess up and go back to prison? It's a metric of failure. And I think what education does it allows it's allowed me and a lot of my colleagues to sort of flip that and say, okay, we're not going to focus on. Uh, we're going to change the metrics. We're going to use metrics of success. Uh, how many people? Uh, uh, how many folks are out here and they're doing excellent and they're succeeding? Uh, uh, and they're, you know, so I think you know, um, uh, once we once we're able to uh, control those uh, uh, narratives uh, and put them out there, I mean, there's so many platforms that we have nowadays, right? And I think that's one of the reasons that abolition is sort of taking off, right? That the, that the uh, news media, these large news media, no, no, no longer people are no longer dependent on them, right? People are now exchanging information through these social media platforms. A young black kid in Harlem can exchange information with a young white kid in, 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 in Germany instantaneously, right? And they can share information in real time. Uh, and we're no longer dependent on the media to shape these narratives, but um, but they do. They still uh, uh, control a lot of it, and fear is is, is one of their you know uh, has been weaponized, and it's always been weaponized, uh, particularly. Uh, uh, against black and brown people, so, but I think people are starting to realize that, uh, starting to see it for what it is, it's fear mongering, and uh, and they're seeing past it, and they're seeing past the bullshit, and they're saying, okay, we know what it is. Uh, uh, let's let's set that aside and look at uh, what we need to look at and take care of what we need, what we need to take care of. So. Thank you so much, and you know when you were talking about the weaponizing of fear, I think that was so uh, powerful and it makes me think also about um, like the nonviolent versus violent dichotomy and we what we've been hearing a lot in Tennessee is you know yeah but not for people with violent charges and you know and that doesn't take into consideration you know 
all of the things that all of the evidence that we know all of what we've been through as people um and it really misses the fact that you know our country commits the most unspeakable violence you know throughout history and even now so really just you know part of this uh education that we need to do is just having this paradigm shift around violence as well um and so we have um, only three minutes left, but I wanted to give everyone um, uh, time for final words. Is there anything else that you would like to say in conclusion? And we just need to keep this to around 30 seconds uh, for everyone. So um, would anyone like to go first? I mean, I'll just start and, and pick up on where Ivan left us and, and you left us, Dawn. Um, you know, we learn to fear, uh, and I live sometimes in a rural part of the country, and when people come up to visit, they get, they're really scared. And I'm like, why are you scared? And it's like, well, we talk about it, and like, well, they only saw scary things in the country on, on, in movies, right? So we're, we're taught to fear each other, and um, part of abolition is learning that we don't have to do that, but it's going to be a very slow walk to make sure that we can all trust each other, and I'm happy to join you all on that walk. Thank you. Would anyone like to go next? I'll just say I'm really grateful to the organizers of this conference and it's so great to be with you all today. And thanks, Don, for leading us. I want to say it's been, it's been an honor. Thank you, guys. I'm a little under the weather. I, I, you know, I, I'm just been feeling a little hinky today, so, uh, so I'm sorry if I uh, didn't communicate as well as I could have. But um, it's been an honor. Thank you, guys. And uh, Gina and uh, Dan, you've given me a lot of stuff to think about, and uh, I'm going to take it back and sort of bash it against my own ideas and see and see what happens. Thank you. Thank you all so much. You've been great panelists, and I'll give my last words. Um, everyone, get organized, build relationships, build community, build power, build infrastructure, and build new in institutions, and we can get to abolition. Another world is possible. And in some ways, it's already here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a great rest of the conference.